Hi there, and welcome to a slightly different interview today because um, I had a comment on one of my YouTube videos and it absolutely took my eye. I'm going to read you the comment and you'll understand why I wanted to get in contact with this person. So um, it was on a success story where someone had really good success on carnivore and their kidney disease. And this is what this person wrote. September 2017, diagnosis, stage five renal failure, a GFR of five. Ate grass-fed steaks, veggies, cut out anything that couldn't be found in the woods, a.k.a. you did the animal diet. Fasted 24 hours on occasion. October 2021, doc takes me off dialysis. Yes, you heard that right. Uh, November 2021, discharged as patient is too healthy to continue treatment. So... Wow. Did I have to respond to that? I think I did. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to introduce the person that wrote that comment. This is Eric. Hi, Eric. Hello, everybody. How are we doing today? <laughs> All right. Well, I think, you know, that that comment is is amazing. And um, we've spoken a little bit via email. But yeah. Eric, if you could just give us, and it doesn't even have to be a potted history, a history of how you ended up you know, on dialysis and what you did and, and, and that. I've got some of the technical blurb that you sent me that I'm quite happy to read out at any point. If you want to say just what was the, uh, what did it say in the medical file? You've, you've sent me some stuff, so I can go through that yeah. with you as well. Well, let, let's just hear from you, Eric. Yeah, those big giant words I can't pronounce, but I do remember one of them was fibrosis. Um, but anyway, how it started. I didn't even think that kidney failure was going to be a thing that was going to come up. I thought it was like an ulcer or something because the way my stomach was hurting. And I was paying more attention to the stomach pain than the back in the back pain. And then I, and then I started to realize like my vision was having issues. Like I would actually, my eyes would go completely black. So I got to experience quite a few times what it's like to be blind. So I'm thinking, oh man, I need to go, you know, all right, let's go to a doctor. So I go into a doctor, he does some blood work for me, pushes around, he goes, no, I don't think it's an ulcer. I'm like, are you sure? Because the way you're pushing really hurts. Like, it was an intense pain. I couldn't even sit up straight. I was always doubled over. It was horrible. So the next morning after my blood labs came back, I get a phone call. In the phone call, because I was somewhere where I couldn't pick up the phone, I just let it go to voicemail. And the voicemail was like, hey, this is Doc so-and-so. Um, we got your blood lab results. You really need to go to the ER right now. Drop whatever you're doing. Come by my office, get the blood labs, and go to the emergency room right now. That was the phone call I got. And I'm like, whoa, what did they find? And he's mentioned a word, creatinine. I had never heard of that word before. So I'm like, what's this creatinine stuff? So we go to the ER. They checked my blood pressure, and it was so high that the nurse's eyeballs actually almost popped out of her eyes. I was admitted before they even got the cuff taken off. Like, it was an insane number. They're looking at me like, how's this guy even walking around? They take me into the ER. They pump me full of a bunch of IVs so they can start finding out what's going on. Spent three nights in ICU to get my blood pressure under control. And then they move me to the medical service ward where more blood tests come through. And yes, I did count 683 total blood tests in those 13 days. Uh, they gave me access to my medical records, and I got bored, and I'm laying, I'm like, counting, counting, counting. They come back and go, hey, we're going to do a biopsy on your kidney. And I'm like, okay, so this tells me something. And there's a funny story about that where they're like, yeah, we're going to fast you, and your biopsy will be in the morning. And then they take me down there, and then emergencies happen, and I didn't get the biopsy, and I didn't get to eat. So they take me back up, give me a small sandwich, and they take me back down the next morning. They do my biopsy. Not a big deal. I mean, it's you feel a little prick and it's over. Um, and then the doc comes in and goes, hey, um, everything's coming back. Looks like your kidneys fail. And the doc said, okay, so what do we do? Doc looks at me and goes, you're taking this very well. I say, well, yeah, because I'm still alive. And as long as I'm alive, I can do something about it. So right there, I'm going to tell you, your attitude in whatever situation is going to play a role in this. They tell me my choices are hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, and I will most likely be put on a transplant because my kidney, the good one, has about 5% function. So, selected peritoneal dialysis, got a really good care team crew. I had a nurse, social worker, nutritionist. One of the nutritionists I actually had was the one of the nutritionists for the U.S. swim team, Olympic swim team. So, I actually got to meet one of those nutritionists. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're cool. 
fun people to work with great support like everything about him was awesome um we did butt heads a couple times but you know those are little personality things but overall put on dialysis given sheets do a monthly blood lab so i get to see what my blood results are i get to see what the levels are and they also start giving me nutritional information hey you should eat this you should eat that i'm like okay well my nurse and i we got to talk and my nurse is actually a guy ray really cool guy and him and i we got into a lot of conversations about food and the impact on the body and one of the things he was doing with his wife was after they would eat he would check her blood pressure and notice that certain foods would elevate that blood pressure and we were talking about hey you know what's what's a pure diet like what's the cleanest diet you could possibly get well it's not gonna be your frozen food section and major grocery stores I'm going to say that their meat department, I'm going to put a little asterisk under the health windows because of certain things. Because the butcher shop that I happen to find here in San Antonio deals with local farmers who grass feed their animals until the last 30 days and then give them some grain, which basically boosts the flavor of the marmaling and makes it look pretty, which 30 days of grain, I really don't care. But if you look at that meat, and you compare it to what you see in the major grocery store, it's a nine day difference. You're looking at a deep, dark, beautiful red versus like this pink. This you pink sauce. Like, ooh. <laughs> the other thing I did too is I started looking around for local produce. And my nurse actually got me set up with this place. Uh, if I remember right, the name was the Farm Connection. Where a bunch of local farmers basically like co-opted and say, hey, we're going to sell locally. So they would pull together and somebody would basically go around and take orders from everyone. They'd reach out to the farmers and say, hey, do you have this available? And they say, yeah, sure. So every week you would place your order and then you would pick it up the you know that week. So you would get fresh produce locally. So the nutritional value in that is a whole lot higher. And the reason for that, what I found out was when you import produce from another state, or another part of the world, they have to pick it earlier. So it does not spoil before it gets to the store. So it doesn't really get the full nutrients. Ah, nutrients, clean food. So long story short, I was put on dialysis in September of 2017. I was basically told, hey, you're gonna be on dialysis and you're gonna get a transplant. All right, cool. So we do a dialysis. And then around October of 2021, I go in for my regular checkup and my doc walks in with this grin on her face that I've never, like this, this kid who just got let loose in a candy store kind of grin. And she asks me, how are your kidneys doing? And by this time we've, we've built up that rapport. My doc knows I'm a smart, I'm a smart boy. I said, gee doc, I don't know. Why do you think I come here? You're the one who's supposed to tell me this stuff. She goes, what have you been doing? I was like, what do you mean? Well, we've been noticing some improvement on your labs, and it looks like you've regained some function. I'm like, okay, that explains why doing dialysis made me feel worse. <clears throat> Which actually was something, yeah, fast back up about two, three months when I was doing dialysis, before I would actually start treatment, I'd feel fine. But when I would wake up that next morning, I would feel drained. Like I had no more energy. But once I would start to eat, I'd feel a little better. So the doc asks me, would you mind not doing dialysis for a month? Before she even got the sentence out, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that stuff is no fun. Okay. It's no fun. It's a life prolonging thing, but it's not fun. So that was October 1st when we had the, October 1st, I did the labs. October 4th, we had that discussion. November 1st, I go back for my next set of labs. And because I have access to my medical records, and I know what the numbers mean by now, because I've been studying for four years, I already know what the answer is going to be. And I'm excited. I'm like, I can't wait to go back. I can't wait to go back and get that news. And I walk in, and sure enough, she tells me, we've seen enough function. We're going to take you off dialysis. When would you like to have your catheter removed? As soon as possible. That was November 4th. I was officially discharged. Now, one thing I didn't tell you in the comments, and this is the part that's hilarious. I was discharged November 4th. Saturday the 7th. 
11.54 p.m., my phone rings. It's a 210 number, which is a San Antonio number. It's in the middle of the night. I'm not answering this. I don't care who you are. It's the middle of the night. Leave a voicemail. So they do. And then as soon as the voicemail alert goes off, the phone is called. That same number is calling back. I'm like, What's, hang up on you. Let me get to this voicemail. And I start listening to the voicemail, and it calls again. What the? And I'm listening to the voicemail, and it's the on-call transplant coordinator trying to get in touch with me. You know where this is going? You know how this phone call? You know where this uh, call? You know what this call is about, right? I guess, yeah. Yes, they're doing a status call. You know what that is? Well, they're matching you for an organ, aren't they? Exactly. So three days after I got discharged, they found a potential match for me. Sitting there, bawling my eyes out. Even now, it's, it's still emotional. I told her to stop. Tell them to stop testing me. Move on to someone else. And I told her what had happened. And I was like, I don't know how this is going to play out. But I don't want to take this from someone else. Because I have something. I have this opportunity. And I would not feel right for multiple reasons. But one, I don't need it. Someone else needs it more than me. And well, the other is, y'all didn't do your paperwork right. And I don't think I'd would actually get it if I went down there anyway. You'd find out like, oh, you were discharged three days ago. But yeah, so she's totally in disbelief about that. And she's like, do you mind if I tell people and, and we talk to you again? Like, yeah, sure. Call me tomorrow. So I got a couple phone calls from them and everybody was like, what, mom, what? And then not too long after that, the discussion came up. Well, what about his transplant status? Because I'm not on dialysis. So technically I don't need an organ. And there was discussion about taking me off the di off the waiting list. There was a big discussion. My care team, university hospital board members, and all the people that make those decisions got together and said, we're going to make him inactive. So I'm still on the list for an organ, but I'm inactive. The reason they're doing that is just in case later on in life, things go sideways. I get credit for all that time that I spent on dialysis. Wow. Yeah. So that was that was uh, 2021. So we're now in 2023. For those that are listening, uh, you know, these things are evergreen. So it could be 2031 when people are listening. So that was 2021. We're now in 2023. Are you having constant blood, you know, having labs done every quarter? What, what's, what's happening now? Uh, my next labs will probably be next week. Um, it's gotten to the point where when it started out, it was like labs every day while I was in the hospital. And then it was every couple of weeks when I got out. And then it was every month. Now that I'm done, it's like, hey, how you feeling? Why don't you come down and do some labs? All right, I'll be there next week. Because right now it's September of 2023. It's almost two years. Two years after I was taken off. In November will be two years. My entire life is completely different than what it was before that my vision no more issues my body is completely it's not a flat fully amoeba like there's tone you know i look at my legs i look at my arms and i'm like well good and the funny thing is is i don't work out that much like i don't hit the gym all the time you know i'll, I'll do spats here and there or I'll go to the gym for a few weeks at a time, but then I'll stop. I'm not that athletic kind of guy, but people that look at me think I am just because that I have, you know, I don't carry a lot of body fat. I try to avoid foods that will do that. So now, there's a million dollar question, you see, because uh, we are told by those that know better, allegedly, that in your situation, the biggest thing you should be avoiding is beef, red meat. What are you eating? Uh, red meat. <laughs> <laughs> I've eaten just about every animal I can find. Um, but my go-to, because it was the most available, were New York strip steaks, ribeye steaks, grass-fed from my local butcher shop. That was my go-to. I would probably eat three to four steaks a week. 
Well, there you go. And, and do, do you yeah. feel that um, was there an influencer or something you read, or was there a particular person that made you think it was going to be okay to do this? Nope. It just wasn't like it. it wasn't it wasn't anything in particular. It was just hey, why don't I eat stuff that's cleaner? And then mm. I've kind of referred to it as the animal diet because if you look at the animals in the animal kingdom, you look at the lions, the cheetahs, the tigers. They're not fat. Look at the gazelles. They're not fat. What are they eating? They're eating what you can find out in the wild. So that's where that kind of came into play. So, okay, if I can grow it on a tree, if I can plant it in the ground, it's not processed. Like, literally, my menu came down to less than a dozen items. So it got really you, small. Yeah, yeah what ahead. else are you facing them? I... My menu became venison, deer, for those who don't know, elk, which is really good, bison, <laughs> which is really lean. Um, that was my main staple for the ground meats, um, mostly because that's where that's what I could find them in. I couldn't find like an elk steak down here in San Antonio. If somebody knows of one, please leave a comment because I'd love to find one. Um, so I would use those and I would mix that with, you know, some vegetables. Now the vegetables that I enjoyed were red peppers, onions. Um, I would also make my own little kind of pico, which if, you know, you're in San Antonio, Texas, you know what a habanero and a jalapeno are. Add in some onion, some cilantro, some lime juice, and yeah, tomato. And when you cook up your steak, you put that with it, you get a little bit of flavor, a little bit of garlic powder, not salt, and a little bit of back black pepper for flavoring that's all i needed that was my diet for four years and even now because it just tastes good mm. well yeah and it sounds tasty and it sounds like it's working for you which which is amazing I, I, i'm going to do a nitty-gritty sort of question what about urination is that is that sort of pretty normal mm -hmm. i still have foam it's still bubbly so i'm not totally out of the woods but as far as urination that's I've never really had times where I didn't have an issue with that. I was given water pills because I was at points retaining water. And I would take the water pills and it was like Niagara Falls, man, like fire hose time. Better go to the bathroom real quick. So I think, and they also had me on some other, you know, stool softeners and laxatives too. So I think between all this, like, this good stuff coming in and this everything getting filtered out as much as it was because I was going to the bathroom a lot. Like, I was peeing a lot. They say you should only drink a liter while you're on dialysis. Well, I did a whole lot more than that, but I'd also pee a lot more. And, you know, I, I monitor my weight because they make you check your weight every day. They make you check your fluid levels every day. So I got real good at gauging, like, okay, I drank too much this day or I can drink a little bit more this day. Because I was paying attention, mm. paying attention to the way my body felt, paying attention to the records, the results on my dialysis, because it, it would literally calculate how much fluid it withdrew every night. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, just just for people that maybe have a bit of foamy urine and they're worried there's something wrong with their kidneys. If you're eating a bit more protein, that is also one of the the reasons you get foamy urine because you are excreting some of the nitrogen and uh, you get a bit of foam doesn't mean there's something wrong with your kidneys necessarily. It's um, but it's, it's something to be aware of. Well, I'm going to go back to your medical file because we, we talked about that before we came on. And I think, you know, now you're talking about not needing the transplant. I'll just go through what it says here. Um, this was nine fourteen twenty seventeen. 2017. Uh, a nephrology note, malignant uh, nephros, uh, nephrosclerosis, which is uh, just basically a thickening or a hardening, hardening, by the way, sclerosis. If you ever hear that, it's just part of the artery normally, some sort of fibrous interstitial tissue thing. Uh, with extensive severe fibrosis, atropic tubules and global glomerular sclerosis from severe hypertension. Renal US also showed increased echogenicity that suggests CKD in addition to complex right renal cyst. Nephrology assessed his kidney's injury as irreversible. <laughs> so uh, with your air quotes there on the irreversible. And that is one of the things that I suppose 
one of the reasons you were watching one of my videos was, you know, talking to somebody else who'd reversed their kidney problems. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think they were over stage three, stage four, someone like that. Uh, Amy, I believe she was stage three. Yeah, stage she, three. She's, yeah, she's got the really, like, biceps. Like, she, she's got biceps bigger than me. <laughs> no. yes. God, what are you doing? What you doing? But, yeah, so, um, I... Yeah. I don't know how that video popped up in my feed, and I saw carnivore diet stage three kidney failure reverse, and I was like, "What? Let me check this out." And I was like, "Okay, you did stage three. One up you. I did stage five. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to like one up somebody, but really, these comments that I make, and like I said, my Reddit posts that I made, it's all about telling people like, "Hey, just because the docs told you this doesn't mean it's 100 percent true." You know, there is that chance. And as long as there's that chance, why not try? Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. And it's quite frightening that this sort of uh, conversation might be clamped down on because it doesn't go, it doesn't align with the WHO guidelines. Even this now, as we're talking, if it goes out on YouTube, they may take it down. I, d I hope they wouldn't because it's a true story. It's a real person telling their experience. Um, I got receipts. <laughs> and you've got the receipts, yeah. And uh, you're here to talk about it. And I think anyone that wants to shut down this brilliant story, it, it's just just crazy. And th th that's one of the other things. I really want to thank you for commenting and then actually following it up because I, I'm not pushy. I don't sort of badger people to come on. I just say, that's a great comment. If you want to talk more about it, come on. Because I didn't know what you were going to say. You might have said, yeah, it's a little bit of protein. It's not much, actually. I, you know, every day I'm eating blueberries. You know, I don't really care. It's not an agenda. It's it's wanting to find out how somebody has done something, re reverse something that's irreversible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yep. that, that's great. Eric. I mean, do, do you feel like there's any more uh, you want to go over? Is it is what actually got you to that point in the first place? Were you eating really bad? Was you oh, drinking was too much? Bad. What caused oh. it, do you think? I had a horrible diet. I thought that chicken tenders were healthy. They're not. The chicken is, but that's about it. Um, yeah, I was eating bad, dude. Fast food. Food mm -hmm. trucks. Drinking good, nasty, just whatever. Like, oh, let me get that big giant energy drink. Oh, chug, 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 chug. What was I thinking? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's so easy to do that. And you're surrounded, you know, saturated by terrible uh, food that's not good for you. That scientists yeah. in the lab somewhere are making deliberately addictive. So, you know, you're not 100% to blame. There are people out there that are trying to get people addicted and eating too much. That, well, you, you got a point. You got a point there, actually, because while I was in the hospital for kidney failure, they have seven channels on the on the hospital TV, and two of them are on the hospital channels, and three of them are in Spanish. The couple of channels that I did get to watch, one of them would always have the Wendy's Baconator commercial. It's three slices of beef with a whole bunch of bacon and this enriched bun. And I'm like, that's the reason I'm here. Get that out of my face. And I almost kind of had to ask the hospital. I was like, why are you allowing this on your TV? You're promoting bad health while you're sitting here trying to fix us. Doesn't mm. work. Like it's totally the, there's very little advertisement for healthy eating and healthy lifestyle. Very little for it. But beer commercials, they're everywhere. Fast food commercials in America, they're everywhere. You do you drive... um, go ahead? Do you, do you avoid things like seed oils as well and breads and all that sort of stuff? Uh yeah. I've got like the only and I don't even consider it a bread, but I I kind of like I'm not quite sure how you would call it because it's a starch and but if I crave bread, I'll do rice. I'll do steamed rice. I've got my own little steamer over here. And he's a wonderful little thing. Takes about 45 minutes to do a nice, good steam. And it's some really good rice. Occasionally, I'll do some bread. But it's like a once in a time, once in a blue moon thing. Maybe like biscuits and gravy because I love that stuff. But when I eat that, when I eat the bread, 
I do notice changes. I'm a little sluggish. And if I eat too much, you know, if I go binge out on those biscuits and gravy, I'll get a headache the next day. I'll have a migraine for the next day or two. Yeah. Guaranteed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Once you once you go to those wheat products or sort of seed oils, I, I I'm the same. If I if I sort of let not let my guard down, that's the wrong word because it makes it sound like it's militant. But if I eat the wrong thing because I'm just feeling social, it's normally when I'm trying to be sociable and I don't want to be that guy that's causing the problem because he doesn't want the bread and all that. <laughs> um, I the next day I, I I certainly know that I've not been strict carnivore. So um, I'm just flip, flicking through your stuff that you sent me, and I think we pretty much covered everything. But I just want to ask you one question because uh, I'll give a little bit of my story. I, when I was in my 40s, I had lower left quadrant pain. I'd lost both my parents when I was young. My mum was from colon cancer. She never touched red meat, never ate fat. Um she was pretty much plant-based, but I didn't consider that that was maybe the issue for her colon cancer. And there was I sitting in, you know, an ICU bed, having a colonoscopy for this severe pain and thinking, right, here I am, 48, I'm going to die of colon cancer because it's written in the stars. It's genetic and that's it. I can't do anything about it. Hold and on, I was hold absolutely... Hold on. I'm going to pause you for a second, not to interrupt you. You're 48. Uh, no, that's when that happened. I'm I'm 59. I'm 60 next year. Hold on. Let me put my glasses on because I have <laughs> no, no, no. You're younger than that, fool. <laughs> Look, born 1964. I've got the receipts. But anyway. You may have a T-shirt, but I'm not buying what I'm seeing. <laughs> that's okay. You can go on stasis for 20 years, dude. You look good for your age, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But, uh, well, I'll take the compliment. That's very nice. But, um. And I remember being absolutely petrified. Now, you spent a day in ER. You were immediately moved to ICU, which, which is not a good sign. I mean, were you, were you thinking this is it? This is, I've had my chips. I'm out. I had that discussion with myself. And I was like, well, if this is it, this is it. So thank you for doing this video because – No problem. You know, people people worry, and I, I get lots and lots of messages. Today, I had maybe three messages saying I'm absolutely petrified. I've had my blood. Da da da. What do I do? All this sort of stuff. So these sort of things are just uh, amazing stories of, you know, being close to uh, saying goodbye to everybody, and and it's incredible the power of a really good um, nutritional plan. I'm not saying that that's the thing that's going to cure everybody, but this story certainly, you know, it's played such a big role in it, hasn't it? Yep. And on a little sad note and to kind of put this in a little more light, my aunt who was, who refused to have a healthy diet, ate bomb bombs, garbage food, when mine, she ended up becoming diabetic and she never changed her eating habits and it got worse. Around the time that I was healing, she passed mm. from complications from diabetes and organ failure. So yeah. it does, it really, what you eat can seriously impact and i'm not going to say it will but i'm going to use the word can because i've seen both sides of it i've seen where people don't make the changes they keep eating the junk food and they die yeah I, and um, i am went that way so yeah. my stepfather my my stepfather um later in life was very diabetic so i've seen amputations due to diabetic complications. I mean, one of my hats is a specialist practitioner on obesity and diabetes, and it's serious. Yeah, and, yeah, down to Hardcore. food. Uh, I didn't know then what I, I know now, which would have made a big difference. But, yes, yeah. uh, you know, it is serious, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And for those people that are watching the video, hopefully this has been inspirational. If you've got a personal story and you want to drop a comment, it could be you sitting there. But anyway, Eric, that it's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure, a really lovely guy. Really nice to meet you, and I, I'm just pleasure. so pleased you followed up on that comment. I'm just, I'm glad you you replied back and said, "Yeah, I'll come on." 
hey, you seem like a genuine guy, and I, you know, watch a couple of your videos, and you know, genuine people, I'll I'll hang out with, I'll chill with, even though we're across the pond, and then you know, we had our little spat way back when, you know, when uh, we had to kick you off the continent and just claim our independence. I still love you. <laughs> Eric, thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. The thing I forgot to tell you is I got a T-shirt made for this. I don't know if you can read it. What does the medical profession, the, the people who come in contact with, do, uh, I mean, surely they don't believe that they're changing you. My doctor actually is, she's like, she's toting it up. Like, this is her career thing. Like, she loves the fact that this happened. Wow, that was a fabulous interview. I hope you enjoyed that. And if you like that sort of thing, I recommend you watch this one next.